Oh dear. Would you like to do it or would you like to do it? I was a vocal player. Oh, okay. This is a little bit more. That's all right. Oh. It's the only time I get to sit in the back. You know? Oh, here it is. My spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be stylish after all. Just welcome, just want to welcome you. And what is going in my head is the last hymn that we sang mm -hmm. in the church. So all we need, you know, is love to love and to be kind. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So, with let us pray. God of all, we know you love all of us, all of your creation. We know you love our beauty, our uniqueness, and our differences. You have commanded us to love one another as you love us. We stumble, we do dumb things, we make mistakes, and for this we turn to your grace. Help us today to listen, to think, and to reflect so that we may grow in awareness, in kindness, and in appreciation for all of us. Let your love shine forth in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. So, it's with great joy in my heart. <laughs> with your friends sitting here, one for each hand. <laughs> Nancy Fortino. Kathleen, I would just pronounce your last session. I still don't know if people here correct. Right. Nobody knows how to say it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. You're on, gals. Uh, hi there. Um, it's funny, uh, Chris, I said today I'm, I'm going to, I'm acting, but I said the facilitator. And Chris said, oh, I thought you were going to be presenting. And I said, no, well, this is going to be an idea of what we're going to, how this uh, is going to go. It really is, we hope, more of a discussion. Um, and maybe I'll just jump to, uh, I want to quote something from uh, Pastor Pete's sermon on RSC Sunday, which I thought was so, um, it just, just moved me. So on part of it. Um, but he said, what do we need for this journey? This our IT journey. Uh, lots of love, lots of listening, lots of conversation, more listening, and more love. Mm -hmm. And I really, that's, that's where I, I think the uh, revolution is going to come from. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, I, I thought just real quick, I wanted to uh, introduce the RIC team, those who are present and not present, but uh, Ayla Batista and Fred Loomis, who is on there. Excuse me, do you want to take your mask down? Because the, um, the mic is right there. there. So um, that the re people you want listen to, to the recording. Yeah. 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 Just when you're talking. So if anyone else wants to present here in the forum, you know what the, <laughs> what the bonus is. <laughs> So yeah, so let me introduce the RIC team. Uh, Ayla Di Batista and Fred Loomis are the co-leads. Hi, Fred. Hi, Fred. Hi, Fred. Hi, Fred. <laughs> um, and now uh, I'll jump to Chris Loomis is also on the team. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Finn Anderson, uh, Debbie Di Batista, Ashley French, Stephanie Jacob, Chris, uh, Sandy Silberger, and uh, support and incredible input, uh, input from Kathleen Dupaz and uh, Jenny Anderson. So, so we have a great, great team. So I thought we'd start with, based on feedback from the first adult forum that was, and I'm going to say it in a long word, 
sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, otherwise known as SOGI. I didn't know SOGI when I first saw it either, but it sure is a lot easier to say. <laughs> um, we'd like to review what makes up the LB LGBTQIA plus acronym. I'm sure Tess is going to do that. Yeah, so just because we were so pressed for time two weeks ago, um, and I had some people asking me about the acronym, right? We throw this acronym around, and it's a lot of letters and not everybody. It's, it's sometimes hard to know what all the letters mean. So I have handouts that I'll pass around. Um, and I just realized literally like five minutes ago as I was looking at it that the font is really small. So I do apologize for that. Um, but um, just. This, this explains sort of one of the common versions of the acronym. A thing to know is that it does vary. People use different versions. Um, but this one has L for lesbian, G for gay, B for bisexual, T for transgender, 2S for two-spirit. That's one that often gets left out of other versions of the acronym. And it's specifically an identity that comes from indigenous communities. So it's one you might not come across as frequently. Um, Q for queer, another Q for questioning, I for intersex, A for asexual, and the plus sign, which is used to represent the host of identities that can't be encapsulated by just by these terms. So all of these are sort of umbrella terms, right? Like lots of different people might identify as lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, two-spirit, queer, questioning, intersex, or asexual. Lots of different people might identify with each of those labels. And so that's um, one of the things that the plus sign represents. And then there are also a host of other identities that may not be represented by these terms, um, but that are marginalized or non-normative um, and therefore fit into this sort of umbrella. And two weeks ago, um, I said that I often use the word queer as an umbrella term. And that's another way of encompassing lots of different identities that may or may not have a specific label. Um, so we can talk more about this later. It's not actually the focus of today, but knowing the right language to use is an important part of being hospitable and welcoming. Um, so in that way, it is extremely relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, and you have this to refer to this sheet, this same handout is also on the website. Um, we're collecting an RIC resources web page. So it's udlc.org slash, slash RIC resources. And there's a link from the regular RIC page as well. So any resources that we hand out in this space or send out in the weekly email are also always on the website for you. Um, and certainly if you have questions about any of these terms, or you want more extensive definition, you're welcome to ask me. Um, and, and I can help you, I can point you in the right direction. Um, but I just wanted to, we wanted to introduce that because the language we use and the way we understand these terms is so important to welcoming people with these identities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think what we'd like to do is start with a question uh, to put out to you guys to help us answer. Um, the question is, um, you know, we're talking about exploring the importance of hospitality. Exploring the importance of hospitality. Um, I want to kind of go around the room. Anybody that's uh, got got some input, so about when have you felt unwelcome in a space? Maybe what caused the feeling, and and what was the feeling? So I kind of wanted to get. They may not be unique. Uh, maybe it's something we can all relate to. Come on. This is like an opposite thing. Louder, Claire. <laughs> oh, well, I got a big mouth. <laughs> um, as I said before, I have two sisters that are gay. And for years, they never came out. They never talked to me. Well, my one sister talked to me a little bit about it. But my other sister never talked to me about it. And I, I knew it, but she just didn't talk to me about it. Well, they would have celebrations together. And I was never invited because I was the different one. So when my sister Elaine turned 50, I said to my sister Dolly, you better invite me to that 50th birthday party. Mm -hmm. I didn't get invited to yours and I want to go to hers. Mm -hmm. So I went to the party and my sister came in and I was the only straight person there. And my sister was totally shocked. And uh, I looked at her and I said, did you think I didn't know? Did you think <laughs> you didn't talk to me? But the funniest part was, 
people kept looking over into it and saying, oh, you're the straight one. You're the straight one. <laughs> so I was, I was like the odd one out, but it was, it was perfectly fine because I could sit there and talk to everybody and explain the situation. How, and my one sister, Elaine, her, her mate was married for 25 years and had four kids. So she said, do you think it was very easy for us to talk to other people about when I was married and I had four kids? I said, I'm her sister, though, and I love her no matter what. But anyway, I was the odd one out. I was the one that was uncomfortable in the beginning, but everybody was very welcoming to me. So it was reverse, like, uh, you know, prejudice, kind of, you know. But anyway, it was a little bit difficult, but it was fine, and it brought my sister and I closer together. After she realized I, I wasn't so dumb that I didn't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. all that time. Yeah. Is that bad? Yeah. It is. I mean, it's very sad, but I, I never, I was always very, didn't know how to bring it up to her. I just thought she should bring it up to me. So I showed up so she would know as I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. I don't have a situation uh, in that context, <laughs> but. Um, at one point in my other life, I was attending a conference um, and it turned out I was the only white person. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I had been in that, in such a large mass. And I sat there thinking of what a number of my students must have felt over the years, walking into a predominantly white environment mm -hmm. and sitting there. And I know it's hard for you to believe if you know me that I sat there quietly. <laughs> but I did for a while and then finally thought, screw this. <laughs> so I just started walking around, you know, in the day when we could shake, shake hands, you know, and introducing myself. And God, I have to say, my, and also in my further past life, being with Black people was very common. But anyway, introduced myself and just talking and had lunch. Uh, with four ladies that just entertained me from beginning to end. And it was one of the best times in my life that I can think back of being accepted, uh, being trusted, because we started sharing some stories and how quickly, now I know women can do that easier many times than you guys, but that's okay. And I walked away thinking, okay, I need to build on this. And I, so that's, but I think some things that happen to us that are just either insightful or, or transforming, we're not done with it. We need to keep building and building and building and not to get caught up with what we don't know, but where we're going. Um, I think one of my first memories, um, I grew up in a very small, white, middle-class urban town in and we had an ecumenical group in town because none of it had enough youth groups to do their own thing. And we decided to do a <coughs> ecumenical youth group mission trip. And we went down to Elon College, their children's home. Um, and we went down and there were 25 of us on the trip, all very sheltered white kids. And we walk onto this campus of all children and mostly preteens and teenagers who have, or at least at that time, they were almost, none of them were white. Um, many of them had been down around the foster system, lived very rough lives, come from very rough circumstances. So I mean, polar opposite skills. Um, and we walked onto that campus and we were excited to go down and help people and make a difference. And got there and they, the people running the place had said, you guys are been in the car a long time, go hop in school relax a little bit and we're walking across that campus and the kids that lived there came out of the houses that they lived in front of the and started yelling stuff at us, calling us crackers, calling us every name in the book you could think of. And it was scary. Um and it was very intimidating and we're all we, we cut teacher all week. And I joke around and it was my Disney movie moment, but they came to us and said that one of the things they needed to do was to weave this softball field that um, somebody 
that somebody um, had, they had made this field for them and nobody had used it or maintained it. So it was weeds up to your waist. And they, um, so they said, can you weed this field for us? And they had some of the kids help us. And over the course of the week, we did, and out in August, weeding in North Carolina. And at the end of the week, we built relationships and got to know each other as teenagers and just found the things we liked in the same TV shows. And we figured out how much stuff we actually had in common that we never would have, if we had just taken that initial reaction and run with it. Um, and we ended the week by playing a softball game kids on this field that we mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was just me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just around it was like, this is me, you know, if you build it, they will come home. Mm -hmm. um, oh. but, <laughs> but it was just for, I was 15. But it was just one of those things where we went from being so uncomfortable and scared and not knowing how to react or be around these other teenagers to ending the week. And um, we all stayed in touch with several of them for two years. But it was just one of those things that stuck with me. So, <laughs> Yeah, 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 just a long time ago, uh, back in high school, you know, we, we were active in church, but um, religion wasn't necessarily like a, uh, a a focal point of conversation among friends. And you know, just my best friends, which are we're still my best friends, fortunately, so many bad. Uh, my best friends just happen to be over the course of time like ninety percent Jewish, you know, and uh, you know we were uh, going through a high school graduation and all that stuff we deal with it that you know they enjoyed at that time. And I so uh, so so we had various parties and things like that. And I remember going to a party and not thinking anything of it, you know, being invited to the party and going with all my friends and uh, and, and uh, a lot of people I knew really well, you know, and, and some people I didn't know very so a gentleman comes up to me and says, oh, what are you doing here? I said, oh, okay, I'm friends with uh, Susie and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, no, you don't understand. What are you doing? And I'm kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm not really clear on this question. He's like, you're not Jewish. What are you doing? And I'm, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so I was like, oh, 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 oh. yes. I'm like, oh. Let me repeat myself. <laughs> I'm friends with blah 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 blah. And if you not being, you know, you know, is that if that's an issue for you, then then we're going to have to figure out a way to make it work. But like, I was like, like really just like, yeah, you know, I was naive, obviously, but I was you know, um, really just kind of like, you know, being like, always, you know, just admittedly like always kind of like in a majority type of demographic that it just never really dawned on me that um you can oh it, it, it just the whole concept of exclusion and and inclusion was never was never really something that like was on my radar screen so so i just did you know barely even knew like what that what the the subject matter was like completely foreign then i'm like oh, oh okay i'm, like, I'm sorry Jewish, but they're they're my friends, you know what I mean. So it, it was it was an eye opener, I guess, is what it was. You know, it was an eye opener. Um, Can I say something real quick? <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, like all of these stories. Um, I think George, what you just said about not being aware of it, like just not even having it on your radar, is yeah. such an important piece, right? And like when you are in a majority or you're in the like sort of the group that has power in society because you're white or because you're Christian or, um, you know, because you're straight or whatever the thing is, whatever that identity marker is, like, not that, like, not having that awareness is exactly why we're having these conversations, right? Because it's so easy for us to just, like, not, not be aware, you know, not even notice what we're doing or, like, um, you know, how easy it is for us in a, a certain sector of society. Not that your life's easy all the time, but, like, in a certain area of society, right? Um, and, and the, and, you know, Claire, your sisters, the way they felt like they had to hide um, or your Jewish friends, like, you know, feeling like they had, you know, they needed this space that was mostly Jewish and that then you were suddenly the outsider, right? Like that's an awareness that people with marginalized identities have 
that people with privileged identities don't necessarily have. And I think that's exactly why we're having this conversation. So thanks, that's a really, that's a helpful sort of um, insight. Okay, I appreciate you bringing you know that, that together. Yeah, yeah I just I'm hearing these pieces yeah, and all these stories. Yeah, yeah me too. Because uh, maybe just a couple of real quick for me is that uh, Nancy. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. 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 So for, for Deb and I, uh, kind of interesting through, uh, we've been together like 30, I think going on 36 years, and uh, we we would have not been out. We've not been out. Um, so in our neighborhood, people always think there's a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Deb's a bookkeeper, I'm an engineer, and I'm a school teacher. <laughs> That's been a common thing. Um, so as long as we could pass, um, I, I think that's something that's a privilege for us. Me, a lot of us can pass. Um, although a place I worked and I finally came out after uh, I don't know what year it was, certainly after 2010. Um, they said, Nancy, I know. <laughs> uh, and Nancy, by the way, everybody knows. <laughs> so uh, that's something that if people don't say it to me, uh, I feel like. They, um, they have think about you and your sisters, that they don't, they're afraid to hear the answer. So I never volunteered. Well, you volunteered at the thing. <laughs> the first time I met you. And, and, and <laughs> that's after uh, 2016. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Right. Uh, Deb had retired. Um, I'm at this point in my career, so I don't. <laughs> 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 but, but kinda, I just want to run it because I wasn't sure if you were. Coming up to me as a challenge to see what I would say or what I would do. You were being so friendly, so I just wanted to make sure that you knew me at that were day. You know that, right? Yeah, I know. I don't know, but I mean, it, and it is, it is uh, it's been quite a journey here as well. Oh, sure. And then the answer is how you dealt with me. What's that? How you uh, dealt with me. Well, Dottie came up with, uh, as a welcoming and, and said, Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> so it's been, you know, thank you. That was our, our first impression. <laughs> but um, so Deb and I, uh, then we we were we came out and then we were at places and um, people would be rude, you know, like we'd come in and just kind of we'd be rebuffed in certain places. And um, and we're not PDA people either, by the way. We're not public display of affection, but but just because we were, I, I said we are apparently public. And um, oh, we said, are they rude or are they homophobic? Mm -hmm. That's been sure. kind of our That's we legitimate. Try to, we yeah. try to figure that out because. Yeah. But then, just the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, as I was coming up at work, they would have um, uh, spouse events and family events. I don't know if you guys had it at work. And I was an engineer trying to go ahead and get ahead. So they'd have these events where you're supposed to bring your spouse or. Partner, or, yes, or 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 your family. They have like Saturdays that go in the park and all, right? So I never would, and it was it was I'm trying to get a feeling, but it was isolating. It was embarrassing. Um, I think they were meant to bond me. I didn't get the benefit of that. Um, and then uh, one time, I actually brought a date. I I brought a friend, a good friend of mine. I said, "Will you come to this event?" Tired of going by myself, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a man. It was a man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I needed a man to come with me, you know. And it turned out it was terrible because I was lying. You know, I mean, there was a lying of omission before, but this was a downright lie. So um, it was really good. Um, the, the things have changed. Ellen is a turning point, believe it or not. So uh, anyway, this church we came to and said we're going to be a couple. And I look at Keith and I. Uh, and we could die. We said that's how we're going to come in for sure. That was a big move for both of us. And our pastor was the reason that they came. Yeah. 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 Seriously, mm -hmm. you need to know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and even though you knew you had met Keith and you knew he would welcome you, right. it's still scary, yeah. right? No, I didn't have any yeah. idea. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. it's still it's still really vulnerable to get into a situation like that, and it takes a lot of courage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. assumption is that nobody is friendly. 
my assumption is that people are home you know so this is really I'm just going around the room and I, I have no idea what anybody thinks and um this, you. We love this you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you all for, uh, as, 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 as this is, has been happening, I'm feeling I have a lot of out. Uh, sorry, Deb couldn't be here. Uh, we had a little loss in the family. Oh, yeah. Nancy. Nancy. But thank you, sis. That's my career. Great. Um, so, so the next thing I wanted to move to then is what does hospitality for the LGBTQIA plus? I can't fit in that. There are two new letters. <laughs> two letters. <laughs> I will figure it out. There are lots of different versions of the acronym, and different people use different versions at different times and in different contexts. Um, so it's just. You can you you can use it how you feel comfortable absolutely. and sort of meaningful. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. There it is. So so what does hospitality uh, for this community look like specifically in our country? So we'll kind of do do kind of go around maybe think of some ideas that you know we always thought we were welcome at UDLC, right? We we all think we're welcoming, but what what do maybe what element have we been missing uh, that that maybe could help uh, welcome? I agree. I think it's so important. When a person is different, and I mean, the great person here is great more as the service. And it's just a story. And so I, I that, that's why I came here immediately after a couple of us, and they welcomed me and and I just felt fine. So I just think that's important that that is something that I think I see it among us. I that for I've been having a conversation that's very helpful. In here and outside of here. I know Nancy and I have had lots of conversations, <laughs> and Nancy and Deb and Dottie and I have had lots of conversations about this whole subject and how well we get along. I mean, I don't really see any difference in us. I just I enjoy your company. I enjoy Deb's company. I enjoy my sister's company. And I think it can't just be in church, it's got to be outside of church and trying to, to welcome people outside of church too, not just. Make you feel right here, you know. And so I think it has to do with just being kind to everybody. I, I need to second that. Um, it's in conversation, being together in ordinary ways, ordinary days, that um, barriers are broken. I struggle at times with when I hear myself saying, or someone else says, I see no difference. And then I think, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, because I've had my black friends say to me, are you deaf, I'm blind, I'm black, you know? <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, and I need to understand that. But I don't love you in spite of, mm -hmm. which sometimes can come across. I love you or want to be with you because of who you are. Mm -hmm. And what comes with that package, I love. It's not in spite of, but I love you. So that means I either love the color of your skin I, I love your gender identity. I love you. And I, I think our language and how we speak is another factor, not just being open, but being conscious of our words. I mean, you parents, how many times have you said to your children, be conscious of your words? Because, you know, 
hurtful words or unintentional hurtful words, it takes forever, if not ever, to take them back in terms of the hurt that it inflicted. So, you know, I I ask all of us, myself included, to, to think about the wholeness of what we are offering, not just bits and parts. And in order to love someone in their wholeness, we have to know their wholeness, right? Exactly. And so that feeling of having to hide, if, like, if you feel like you have to hide any part of you, then you're not going to be welcome. You're not going to be truly loved. Yeah, my, I'm not my, charged. My I'm sorry. question. <laughs> you can speak. <laughs> it's my my question. Uh, and feel free to answer mm -hmm. later. Um, is what's the balance between the particularity mm -hmm. and the generalness? You know, like, mm -hmm. um, like I get like we don't know like in terms of language, we're going to bumble and fumble. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of you know, like the language part. Um, but the like the well, you know the there's there's one approach to welcoming it's like we treat everybody the same you know and or we think we do <laughs> right or there's a kind of like well we're welcoming and that means we welcome everybody and i you know i hear that a good bit like it's um it's like kind of a blanket um so you know kind of what's the the balance between yes we welcome everybody um but but we welcome in in the particular you know could you speak to that a little bit like um What's the, the kind of balance, or or how do we hold those together? Yeah, what I really appreciate that you're going around something. I got a lot of your peaceful uh, freedom. I say Kathleen <laughs> is um, sometimes you're so articulate. I'm, I'm not so articulate with my words, and maybe I'm better with my feelings kind of thing. So you're an engineer. We welcome your engineerness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy, you're doing very well. You're doing very well. <laughs> very well. Um, but. I think about how Deb and I came, and I uh, my assumption is everyone is home. That is my assumption. So even here, seeing you guys nod is like, wow, that's great. I know you were surprised when you spoke uh, a council that that you didn't know that we didn't know that every that we were welcome <laughs> for me and Deb. Or, um, so that said, I I didn't, I don't, you know, and all these nods are incredible. Of that, but what in particular it would be good if we knew that without having to come out, having to, you know, it would just be great to have it. And, and you know, I don't know what that is. We had some ideas, but the, the, actually the word gay in church, I heard it this year for the first time in my life. Um, and that's what kept us from church. So, um, I think. And then I just want to mention real quick, there's a thing in Florida right now yeah. that don't say gay in the schools right now. So wow. maybe this church is starting to feel really good to me. But then I said that, don't say gay, because, you know, there's a lot of reason that can be bad. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's great to that that help. Helps. And that's where I think at church, that there are things that start to see them appear in the liturgy, RIC Sunday. So, so for me, when I start to see it and hear it, that'll allow me. You know, me too. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I was, I, I just, um, I would build on that and just say, like, because the LGBTQIA plus community has historically been hurt by the church, has historically been excluded, even though this congregation is so, so loving, the assumption for a lot of people walking into any church is that it's not going to be a loving and safe space. Um, and so, yeah, to name those things specifically in our liturgy, at our social events, in our space, um, to, to name specifically, you in your fullness are welcome here, naming the identities and saying, you matter, we love all of who you are, you're safe in this space. Jenny had her hand up. Yes. So, um, so three of our four children are members of the LGBTQIA community. I work a lot with our school district, with our LGBTQIA equity and excellence subcommittee. And what we know is that um, kids know where safe spaces are and who safe people are. Mm -hmm. And the reason they know that is because there are physical signs of that. So when they walk into a space and there's a pride flag, there's a what? A pride, pride. flag? Right. Pride right. flag. This. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Rainbow, Rainbow flag. flag. Pride flag. Okay. They know that that space is open and welcome and safe for them, right? When they have a teacher that uses their pronouns in their signature, 
And when that teacher addresses them by the pronouns that they've asked to be addressed by, they know that that teacher is a safe space. So for people who need it, the really small things like a pride flag flying outside the church or pride stickers on every door when you walk in or on every classroom door as you come in or books that have families that look like your family or materials on the walls that look like you or that are about you um, are signals to the people that need them that this is a safe space. So you have to get people through the door first. And that that requires, I think, an intentionality around some of those physical symbols as well. So when people are driving by, like when you drive by a church and there's a pride flag up front, you know right away that that church is LGBTQIA friendly because they told you. You don't have to know anything else. You don't have to go to the website. You don't have to talk to the pastor. You don't have to walk. To, you don't have to do anything. You know that that church is saying, we love you and you are welcome. It's, to me, that's a very simple expression of your willingness and intention to welcome members of that community but very powerful but very very powerful for the people that need it yes. right it does it may not mean a lot to you or to, like it may not but it means a lot to the people who need it can i just say another thing about children um claire oh yes. sorry oh geez sorry my grandson has asked a lot of questions and i but but we're a very open family talking about things. And I think it's very important for parents to answer their questions. I think it's important to for parents, if they're if they're comfortable with it, which I hope they are, mm -hmm. to explain to their kids that there are differences and, and to love everybody. Um and not to, you know, push people away because they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. My nephew took his kids out of public school. Because public school was learning about LBGQP, and he he was offended by that. And I explained that to my grandson that that's not the way we say it. Yeah. So I just think if your kids come home and say so and so does this or does that or dresses differently or dresses feminine, he's a guy or dresses masculine, he's a female or sees himself as female in the family, you have to explain that God made us all and. He, God accepts us and made us the way we are. And I don't think that parents are doing enough of that yet. And I hope that they will because it does start with parents explaining to the kids things so kids are, accept other kids. I think a lot of parents don't know how. I, and I that's, something, that. that's something we talked that. a lot about in the RIC team. So the RIC team has lots of ideas about the answer to this question of how can we be more welcoming? And that's why we're having this conversation because right. we want to know what you all think. What have we missed? Um, but one of the big things that come up again and again is support for parents, especially of LGBTQIA plus kids, but also just support for parents and education, like how to answer some of these questions when their kids have them. Yeah. I'm just going to say as, as a grandparent of some preteens, I was so thrilled to get all this material mm -hmm. because I put the stickers on my phones, I put things out on my coffee oh, table so that when they come to my house, if they have questions, mm -hmm. they may feel a little freer to ask them mm. because they don't know that I. So I'm that's all sure. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I keep stuff out all over. I do on their Valentines. Yeah. I put those little heart Amazing. stickers on their Valentines, <laughs> <laughs> and they may not have a clue of what it is. But if, if they are having questions about their own identities, they may be aware. Of it. Awesome. And, and then can I also just take it back and, and say, kids know so much more, more than we, than we give them do. credit. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Our kids are talking about this everywhere in a way that we haven't before like we did when we were growing up and they have language that's expansive to explain it and they are accepting because you know it's sort of a world that limits for them in a way that it wasn't for any of our generations and so i think as parents as educators as church people we hesitate to even talk about this thing thinking they're too young they can't handle it they're already doing like they're already doing it we're the ones who are held up not them so yeah I was in a bookstore yesterday and I was looking through the children's books, like picture books, board books, like tiny children. And there are so many books that's like Susie and her two mommies. Um, you know, I'm neither. Um, you know, and it's just like tiny, like very accessible for young children talking about how you can be different. Your family can be different. 
that's okay. That's good. That's lovable. And like, yeah, I didn't have any of that growing up. I'm sure most of you didn't either. It is truly incredible. And it is, yeah, exactly. Like there, these conversations are happening in every sphere and the church is behind. And so we're trying to catch it. Well, I think I've had some conversations. Yeah. Oh, math. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of one of my um, very friends in high school, he we we knew he was gay long before mm-hmm. he was able. He was ready to come out, mm-hmm. and it was interesting because over the years I've had discussions with him, and I also think that it's so important to be supportive of those who are out or have figured things mm-hmm. out but are still not sure necessarily how to communicate. But also being welcoming and open to those who may be questioning things, but mm-hmm. they themselves are not ready to accept, address, and love that part of themselves. Because I think that is also something that when you're, and again, this is not my journey, but when you're in that middle stage of things or haven't accepted it for yourself or you haven't, you aren't at that place where you're ready to share it with others yet, that can be so hard for others too. And I know at least. I mean, this was a long time ago, so things were very different at that point. But in high school, he, he struggled so much with that in-between time of so many of us knew and recognized it in him, but he wasn't ready to accept it and love that part of himself. So just from witnessing it from the outside, I think there's a whole other way and element of welcoming and being accepting of those who may not be accepting it of themselves yet. I don't know how you do that, but I just think that's something else to be aware of when we're looking at stuff like this is how we are also supportive of those who be in this community but aren't open or ready to talk about that part of it. I don't think yeah. Okay. yeah. And having supportive people and welcoming space means that when you're in that yeah. questioning, yeah. Right. confusing, painful time, you know that there are people you can go to and have these conversations with your life. You feel less isolated. Right. Like how do we be there for those exactly. that when they get to that point exactly. they know that we're all yeah. if I could just say mm-hmm. as a member of a large loving family where we have at this moment anyway seven members who have different gender identity than than I but then as a when I was a classroom teacher how do you give out those signals it's in your words but it's also in your own behavior like the kids in my family came out to me first and I was honored I was so honored but I thought back to when I was a teacher and it was signs I was giving out there but we can communicate kindness and acceptance by our behavior as much as with our words and that creates a safety net whether we're talking about and saying like I was so my dear friend over there to say are you married yet or whatever <laughs> I'm, I'm not suggesting but we had we had talked before a little bit anyway <laughs> but, but children have antennae that are phenomenal Mm -hmm. and just because a kid cannot articulate does not mean that they are not taking things in we 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 base maturity so much on words well watch a little (laughs) once you know you learn a lot that so i think it's our behavior as much as our words and and to intentionally i think jenny has used to intentionally show kindness I know you're saying, well, it should be normally kindness. Yeah, but intentionally show it. There's great power in that. Show it with your words. Show it with, with, with your behavior. You know, and people, people pick up on that. You know, they pick up on that. Then you can have the conversation, too. But it, it's just how you, how you exude kindness. Simple thing in the world. You know. You know, the one thing that's missing, in my view, is food. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we all of these events that we have that involve food. We're getting there, Sally. We're getting there. (laughs) (laughs) I know that that's what so you (laughs) know. It's it's biblically proven that food works. I think that's that like also connects to a broader point of just how we structure our social gatherings, right? We love this congregation loves to have social events. So how can we extend this intentional hospitality in social spaces as well as in worship and in 
forum and whatever, you know, and it's an open question. So one of the things we're practicing here is name tags with pronouns. That's a way of practicing hospitality, oh, sort of on multiple layers, right? Just if there's a visitor who's never met any of us, it's hard to remember everybody's names. Name tags are very well said so that they don't have to feel alienated and go, what now, what was your name again? And pronouns, of course, show, it's one of those little, tiny little things that doesn't make a difference to a lot of people, but makes a big difference to some people. Um, and so, yeah, putting our pronouns on our name tags is a way of demonstrating, we're not making any assumptions about who you are. You and your fullness are welcome here. Um, so yeah, in our social gatherings, in worship, in social, in Sunday school, you know, um, in everything we do, in the way that we do service events, whatever it is, like, I think that's, we, we're, we'll be having this ongoing conversation, just continuing to question, yeah, how, could this, one this, done. how could this space, how could this event be more welcoming? I think through this RIP journey, mm -hmm. that we could have, uh, could have, we could have put a flag out front and maybe had some complaints, but you know, we probably could have put a flag out front in January, right? But that's not what this is about. This is about, you know, raising consciousness about making and sincere welcome. And it's about it. so um this is this this is what we're this is the stage of the journey we're at now to have these conversations to be able to welcome people genuinely and and, and it's about meaningful long term yep. changes. Some small, some bigger, but yes. meaningful long term changes. Mm -hmm. And just one more thing I have observed in my life that so often we put the burden of responsibility to the rest of us on the victim. Oh, take the high road, take the high road. Well, you know what? We as non-victims need to start taking that high road, you know, and, and not, for, I, I know human behavior, but it is our responsibility as much as anybody else to make changes within ourselves and make changes available for others too, you know. Because as you heard, it's not easy. There's Claire with her two sisters, Nancy and Deb, how many years? You know? So you know it was really sad as my parents never knew about my sisters. They both died without ever having a conversation with either of my sisters. And I, I just found that very, very sad that my parents never they might have suspected it, they never acknowledged it, and my sisters never acknowledged it to them because it was not acceptable. And I just find that so, so sad. Also, I wish my father never knew. I guess there's we're, different ways. Off, I yeah, well, I guess there is different ways of looking uh, at it and how yeah. parents would accept it, you know, or not accept it. And in that time period, parents were not very accepting of it, but I just, but that being said, I still think it's bad that my parents, you know. Like they didn't know their own children. But they didn't even have the opportunity to discuss yeah. it with them or say, the parents weren't as open back then. You know? They just weren't. Yeah, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, do you have any sort of final I thought? Think, yeah, you can, you guys, you know, <laughs> yeah, how do we want to wrap this up? Mm -hmm. This conversation continues. This is not the end of it. Um, and yeah, like I said, the RIP team has lots of ideas about how we're going to improve our hospitality. Um, but certainly, as you all think about this, your ideas are welcome to let us know. We introduced the members of the team. Unfortunately, not everybody could be here today. But Nancy, Jenny, me, Fred, Chris, if you see any of the others, um, Ayla, Debbie, Sandy, Ashley, Finn, um, we, we want to know. We want to know, like, how can we, in whatever space you occupy in this congregation, whatever roles you fill, whatever volunteer things you do, what are the, what are we missing? What, um, what needs to be improved? Oh yeah, so Keith just brought these in. I haven't gotten a chance to look at them yet, um, but he just handed them to me. These are apparently some brand new books about baptism that we got that show a diversity of families. Um, so I literally was just handed them, but I'm excited. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you want to look at them, start, right? this is a start, right? Yeah. This is something that we're going to be able to do with families um, at baptism to, to share this so that more families are represented in our materials. And we'll, we'll keep going through, you know, Sunday school materials and 
forum topics and you know we're, we're going to continue sort of exploring how we can be more representative more diverse more welcoming in our materials i just want to say thank you to all for coming mm -hmm. i welcome you back next week which will be our fourth and just final one in this series, <laughs> uh, which deals with the intersectionality, meaning um, your gender could be one thing as you also deal with help me here. So intersectionality, your you'll get a come next week. This is your preview. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but intersectionality and marginalization, we're going to be talking about the concept of marginalization, which I know is a term that I throw around a lot in this room. Um, so we're going to dive, dive into it more. And intersectionality just being the concept that um, we have lots of different identities, right? We have gender, we have sexuality, we have race, we have social class, um, you know, we have religion, we have all these different identities that make up who we are. And your different identities and especially marginalized identities can intersect um, to, uh, to, to impact the way you interact with the world, right? So it's a term that comes from black women who said, hey, feminist movements aren't supporting us and anti-racism movements aren't supporting us because feminist movements are led by white women and anti-racism movements are led by black men. And these black women said, not cool, we need to be represented in these movements. So we're, we'll talk about more, more about that last. And why then go, you got a double whammy coming down. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you doing now? Oh, uh, at my dry cleaners in Maple Glen. <laughs> and I said, I was ready to buy her out. She only had three. I thought, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen and Nancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.